Good morning uh, to the colleagues uh, from Europe. I'm really glad that Matthias could join today. And uh, good, good afternoon to people in the uh, East. So like in India, maybe some people from Singapore and uh, Japan. So today it's really my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of my team. Uh, so I think co-convener Dr. Brajbhushan Singh is also there. And uh, Pushpendra Gupta who is helping a lot in the process. I'm really uh, happy and delighted to welcome uh, Professor Oscar Cespedes from University of Leeds, uh, who is a very well-known name in the field of organic spintronics. He's doing a couple of things, uh, but today is more on organic spintronics. And uh, I'm really grateful to him that he kindly agreed to the invitation. And uh, I'm really looking forward to a very nice lecture. And uh, I think uh, many people might know him, but just as a matter of formality, so uh, he obtained his uh, undergraduate in physics at the University of Zaragoza in Spain and the National Laboratory for Pulse Magnetic Fields in Toulouse in France. He got his uh, PhD in 2005 from Trinity College, Dublin, with uh, Professor Mike Coy as supervisor, uh, where he worked on spin transport in uh, nanostructures. Then he moved to uh, Saclay, uh, C.S. Saclay uh, in France, as a postdoc, uh, where he worked on atomic change and magnetotransport in oxides. Then he moved to Kyushu uh, University in Japan, where he worked as a postdoc uh, and then uh, as a JSKS fellow, uh, where he focused on the study of effects of magnetic fields on proteins, uh, remarkable <laughs> biological objects. So then he moved to Leeds in 2009 to start a new activity area in molecular spintronics and magnetism, and he was promoted to associate professor in 2016. He has published over 70 papers uh, as, and many as corresponding authors in uh, high impact vector publications like Nature, PNS, Nanolector, Science Advance, etc. Uh, he has been reported in Cosmos Magazine, IFL Science, uh, The Conversation, Physics World, Chemistry World, Nano World, Magnetics uh, Magazine, etc. So he's also one of the few scientists whom I follow very, very closely. I'm really happy and uh, looking forward to your lecture, Oscar. There are maybe few colleagues who have joined new. Uh, so just to tell them during the lecture, usually we don't take questions. So if you have a uh, question, then you please write in the chat box. After the end of the lecture, we will take all questions. I assure you about that. So with this brief introduction, I request Oscar to start his lecture. Thank you so much. Looking forward. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad to be here. I, I, I hope you enjoy the, the seminar. Um, good afternoon to the people in India. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, everybody else. Um, so my talk is going to be about spin physics at metal molecular interfaces, which is quite a big topic. Um, so I was told that there will be some students or many students in the talk. So I will start with an overview of the field. It's going to be quite extensive. Um, of course, the field is very, very broad. There are thousands of papers in many different things. So I cannot, I cannot even mention even the main papers, but I will mention the ones that mark my path to a certain, to a certain extent. Um, I will then discuss a little bit about magnetism of metal molecular interfaces, then uh, Cooper pair spin triplet conversion. So this is superconducting molecular interfaces or superconducting metal molecular interfaces. Uh, and then we'll do a little bit of spintronics, spin transport, first in uh, spin orbit coupling, spin hole magnetoresistance, uh, AMR, and then in um, a little bit of magnetotransport with optical effects and, and spin storage or spin capacitance. So we will see how we do with time. Um, I would like to give you at least 15 minutes for questions. So in about 40, 45 minutes, wherever I am, uh, I will quickly go to the end. And if anybody's interested and we didn't have time to cover something, please get in touch. And I'm always happy to, to, to discuss with any of you um, anything that you might be interested on. So without further ado, um, when we discuss molecular magnetism uh, and molecular spintronics, what people have in mind when one says this depends very much on their background. So if you say molecular magnetism, most people in physics immediately think of single molecule magnets. That's, that's the first thing that they come, it comes to their mind. These molecules where you have a spin order localized to the uh, single molecule and therefore there is promise for, for them to be used as single molecule memories or qubits or things like that. 
uh, where the ordering temperature usually is in the cryogenic level. Um, nowadays, up to 80 something Kelvin, I think is the record with these protein molecules. Um, so, so things are advancing there a bit. Um, for chemists as well, um, molecular magnetism might refer to, uh, for example, a spin, te um, sorry, molecular um, spin crossover uh, materials or even uh, molecular magnets, molecular magnetic thin films. People in the spintronics community, unless they have been working specifically in, in, in organics, they try to think of molecular spintronics as um, that's what you do when you replace um, an insulated or a semiconducting layer with something organic, most typically in organic spin balls. I'm not sure why they call them organic spin balls. In my opinion, they should be more organic uh, magnetic tunnel junctions. But anyway, that's the sort of thing that comes to mind. Or also when uh, discussing organic magnetoresistive effects uh, or magnetic field effects on, on electroluminescence. However, in the last 10 years or so, uh, there has been a, a, a reckoning that uh, molecular interfaces and molecular films can be used not only to replicate or mimic what we already see in semiconducting or insulating, uh, metallic insulating devices, but can also be used to generate new effects, new, new emerging physics uh, and emerging spin interactions. For example, they are the, the, the classical paper from Barot and, and also recently the paper from uh, the group of Luis Hueso on, on spin photovoltaics. So on the one hand, we have intrinsic effects that are emerging in, in the molecules themselves. Then we have replicated effects where we try to do the same thing we do with crystalline materials, but with organics, trying to see if we have bigger effects or, or a bit different, although usually that is not the case. Usually molecules, because of their low mobility and their degradation, try not to do as well as conventional devices, but um, sometimes, sometimes it's possible an improvement. And then we have the emerging physics that the new functionalities, the new effects that we see when we combine uh, molecules with other materials to give rise to, to different effects. And I, in my opinion, this is where, where the future is. This is what, where my, my talk is going to focus. So for me, all this started when, when I was a PhD student. Uh, and at the time, at the beginning of the 2000s, there were a lot of reports about magnetic carbon, whether carbon could be magnetic somehow. And most of these reports were really not very solid. It was mostly impurities in bulk materials and so on. But my then PhD supervisor decided he was going to try to measure some uh, meteoritic carbon. So he took this uh, sample of uh, from Canon Diablo meteorite, um, which was mostly composed of nickel, nickel iron and carbon. So when you try to measure magnetism, magnetic carbon, and you do it in a sample that already has iron and iron nickel compounds, this is not trivial. Um, and there is always a lot of risk of, of, of misinterpreting what you are seeing. But they were quite confident that the magnetism of the sample was not only due to the iron and the iron nickel compounds in the sample, but that at least uh, some 20 to 50%, depending on which sample they were analyzing, was due to this magnetic carbon uh, where the spin order was induced by the uh, other metallic compounds and where the high pressure and high temperatures that occur when the meteorite hits Earth can somehow form this pyrolytic magnetic carbon. Um, in thermogrammetric analysis, they, they attribute uh, uh, a change, a QD temperature of about 200 degrees C to this carbon, where the other steps could be attributed to conventional materials like magnetite or, or metallic iron. So then uh, we started to do um, experiments in, in thin films and molecules, and that's why I started in this, in this topic. So what we did is place carbon nanotubes on ferromagnetic substrates and do some magnetic force microscopy images. And what we saw is that there was a, a, a magnetic contrast uh, a, a, and a stray field emerging from these carbon nanotubes independent from the magnetic substrate underneath. So we were inducing indeed magnetism in these in this carbon nanotubes. The other interesting paper to me from this uh, area was from the group of Paolo Esquinasi, who published a lot of results on magnetic carbon. But in particular, he did some work together with the BLS, the Berkeley Light Source, um, where they irradiated 
graphite with, with hydrogen, and they did some extensive investments and squid measurements. And they could demonstrate by taking PIM images and XMCD measurements that um, the irradiated areas of graphite with hydrogen did show magnetic contrast and were responsible for the magnetic uh, hysteresis loop that they could see in the sample. It wasn't, it wasn't just that they had impurities. Um, more recently, people started to, to study not only the magnetism of molecules, but the magnetism of molecules when placed on magnetic substrates. Uh, so, for example, there were a couple of papers from the group of uh, Martin Bowen in, in Strasbourg, where they um, studied uh, thalocyanins, which are these molecules, uh, which have a, a metal ion center, in their case manganese, so a manganese ion, and they placed them on different substrates, mostly cobalt, and they studied the hysteresis loops. And what they noticed is that when they had cobalt with these manganese thalocyanins on top, and they feel cool their samples at low temperatures. They had this asymmetric hysteresis loop um, that they attributed to exchange bias. I slightly disagree. We'll discuss that later. But that's how it was presented in first in uh, Nature Materials. Uh, and later, they did the same thing. Uh, they put this in nanoletters. But what they did is they had the cobalt substrate and the manganese thalocyanin separated by a few atomic layers of copper. And what they notice is that when the cobalt and the manganese thalocyanin are directly in contact, they did some XMCD measurements, and they have a ferromagnetic coupling between the uh, manganese center of the molecule and the cobalt substrate. But depending on the separation uh, in the, introduced by the copper spacer between the cobalt and the manganese, you could have either ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic coupling. So, not RKKY, but similar effect in that you, you can alternate the ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic coupling, obviously weakening as you separate both layers, um, but inducing that, that different magnetization in the molecule. Um, then from the group of uh, Sandrine Health in, in Imperial College as well, they also studied the, the magnetism of the thalocyanins, in their case, cobalt thalocyanin rather than manganese thalocyanin. And what they found is that depending on the stacking of the molecules, whether it's beta, so higher angle between the molecules, or alpha, so not quite flat, but mostly flat, uh, you could have a different magnetic arrangement. You could go from paramagnetic to antiferromagnetic. So you could have an exchange that could be negative or positive with different magnitude depending on the angle between the molecules. So they see this as a means to engineer the magnetic properties of your thin film, depending on the growth conditions, temperature, substrate, annealing, and so forth. All this work has been done on thalocyanins, which are very interesting, but because they have a metal center, there is always the doubt of, are we seeing all this because we have manganese and because we have cobalt in those uh, metallic centers of the molecule, or is it really an organic molecular effect? So some groups started to work with pure carbon molecules, most famously C60, including, of course, uh, the group of uh, uh, Subnakar, and of course, our group as well. And perhaps the first paper, or one of the first papers on this was from Tran uh, and, and the groups of De Jong, Van der Wiel, and, and I think Kupranz as well in, in, in Holland. Uh, and what they saw is that if you put C60 on top of iron, you change the magnetization of your metal, uh, which you can see in hysteresis loops again, or you can also see here in XMCD in the iron edge, you can see the L23 iron edge. Uh, there is a difference in the magnetic dichroism of pure iron with respect to this is the iron. If you look at the carbon edge rather than the iron edge, you also can see a dichroism, which will be a sign of induced magnetization in the C60 now without any metal involved in the actual molecule. But the signal was um, considerably weaker, so harder to interpret also because you cannot apply some rules to, uh, to the sigma and pi bonding orbitals of, of carbon. Um, there has been many reports afterwards. Uh, of course, we have the, the work from uh, Dr. Sudnakar, uh, including, of course, where we could indeed see that the reason for this changing in the magnetization of the system is because 
this is, is the couple's first antiferromagnetically to the to the metal underneath and then uh, ferromagnetically and eventually becomes non-magnetic. And this was used, for example, by Bairagi and colleagues uh, to generate out of plane uh, anisotropy in cobalt. So here we have plain cobalt in black measured out of plane in the squid. And what you can see is this is the half axis. So you have a linear slope with a high saturation magnetic field. But as you start to put C60 on top of the cobalt, uh, the thin film slightly starts to become out of plane uh, magnetized. People then also uh, wanted to, to start to grow devices with, with molecules. And the first uh, measurement, successful measurement of, of magnetoresistance uh, in, in an spintronic uh, spin valve for Sonnet Johnson device was the one from Alec de Dieu, where they have LSMO, so uh, a double manganite, excuse me, a manganite. Uh, with high spin polarization, theoretically half metallic, probably at least uh, high spin polarization, but not very high Curie temperature. Uh, and ALQ3, uh, a molecule uh, that was used typically for measurements of, of electroluminescence in between the electrodes. And what they saw is that when, uh, depending on the orientation of the magnetization of the electrodes, like in conventional magnetic tunnel junctions, they could change the resistance of the device by up to almost a giga ohm. Um, so because of the high resistance of the device, the magnetoresistance itself in percentage was perhaps not very high, but the change in resistance was very large. And extended for significantly thick molecular layers of up to 200 nanometers. A couple of years later, uh, um, the group of Bardini in Utah did a more careful um, study um, with using the same, the same system, um, but really managed to measure really beautiful hysteresis um, magnetoresistive effects in ALQ3 uh, organic layers with cobalt and, and um, LSMO. So they, they got this paper in, in Nature, uh, and these two papers really kick off the, the, the area of a spin transport in, in, in organics. Uh, and a few years later, we had the, the, the work of Drew uh, with Steve Lee in, in St. Andrews and the people in, in PSI in Switzerland, where they use muon spin spectroscopy to study the spin polarization of the current coming into the, into the organic. So what they do is they ingest uh, muons and they look at how the muons uh, process in the local magnetic field. I will discuss this a bit more later on. And they could study this way, uh, they induce uh, magnetic, local magnetic fields by the spin current coming into the organic uh, uh, from this spintronic device. Uh, again, um, people was interested in this and, and they wanted to replicate the effects on, on molecules that could be, uh, didn't have metallic centers uh, and could be grown in, in, in ultra high vacuum, more easily than talocyanins perhaps which is the case of C60 again, which because it's a carbon allotrope, uh, it has no hyperfine interaction or the only hyperfine interaction is coming from the carbon-13 isotopes, 1.5% of, of the atoms in the, in the buckyball. And because in theory is, is only composed of carbon, a very light element, the spin orbit coupling should be small. Although because of the curvature of the molecule, that is quite uh, under question whether the spin orbit coupling is really low or not. Um, but in any case, the idea there then is the LUMO of the uh, of C60 is very well placed with respect to the Fermi energy of uh, the transition magnetic transition metals, iron, cobalt, nickel, and, and their alloys. So it should be quite easy to tunnel spin polarized currents into the LUMO, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals for all those of you new to the molecular spintronics. So the equivalent of the conduction band, but localized states. Uh, and then the, these spins will move across the molecules via thermally activated variable range hopping. Um, so because it's a tunneling process, hopefully most of the uh, spins will uh, remain polarized and then uh, they will undergo magnetoresistive effects on the, other left, on the other end of the device. And indeed for five nanometers, uh, Johnson's Wessels group measure very nice uh, magnetoresistive effects, 28 nanometers, Still, you can see a magnetoresistive effect, 
A peculiarity of organic tunnel junctions in general and C60 in particular is that the magneto resistance is very heavily dependent on the applied voltage because you are tuning your LUMO and HOMO with respect to the Fermi energies of your metal. So you can very easily kill or enhance your, your magneto resistive effects. A few years later, there were the paper from Sang et al. in Major Holmes, where they demonstrated that this magneto resistance in C60 was not very heavily dependent on, on thickness, surprisingly and they could see effects up to 100 nanometers layers, uh, 100 nanometers thick layers. Again, very dependent on, on the applied voltage and on the actual roughness of the molecular film. Given that the molecules are relatively big, one nanometer in size roughly, it's difficult to make very smooth um, surfaces with, with them. Um, then, um, of course, once you have measurements in, in thin films, people wanted to do the same thing in single molecules. So there was this recent report from uh, Jan et al, where they did uh, measurements using a scanning tiny microscope. And what they saw is that the magneto resistance is very heavily dependent, again, on the sample bias to the point that you can have anything from the negative magneto resistance of almost 100% to a positive resistance, magneto resistance of 20%, depending on the voltage you apply. And this is partly because the conformation of the molecule and how it links and hybridizes with the metal substrate is very dependent on the, on the applied electric field and also on the magnetic field. So you even have a change in the slope of the magneto resistance depending on this actual applied magnetic field. Um, oops, computer a bit slow. Another very interesting study in magneto resistance, single molecules, for me was the paper from the group of um, Wensdorfer, where they actually managed to fabricate a, a spin valve just out of single molecules. So they have three molecules with a super paramagnetic spin center in a carbon nanotube, and depending, they cool it down so that the super paramagnetic centers will be uh, stable in the magnetization direction over the mesonine time of the, of the experiment. Uh, and depending on the relative alignment of the spins of the three molecules, they could see the, the magnetoresistive effect typical of magnetic tunnel ions or, or spin valves, but at the single molecule scale. What people very quickly realize is that um, these effects were very difficult to reproduce, of course, in particular for single molecules and very dependent on how everything was being done. So the role of the interface, as we have seen at the interface between the uh, either the metal or in this case, the magnetic oxide and the molecule, there is going to be charge transfer, there is going to be a rehabilitation, there is going to be the formation of a dipole and the uh, doping with the spins of the molecule. So depending what you have in your interface, you are going to have a very different effect. And this is what Stefano Sambito from Trinity coined as the spin interface. The fact that you put your molecule on top of the metal and the charge transfer, the rehybridization is going to broaden the molecular orbitals and it may also shift them according to a spin. So then you are going to have a different behavior depending on what you have at that interface. And that was already studied by, for example, the group of Modera where they had this uh, uh, again, ALQ3 uh, tunnel junctions with and without oxide barriers in between the magnetic electrode and the molecule. Um, very famously as well from Moderas and, and Blögel and collaborators, uh, this measurement of, a, uh, and Ato de Rizé, I should mention as well, um, this measurement of, of um, an spin valve behavior in the device where there is only one ferromagnetic electrode. So you have cobalt, which is ferromagnetic, then you have your molecular layer and another electrode that is non-magnetic, and you can still measure a very clear, very beautiful uh, spin valve behavior with double switching and exchange bias. And that is because the molecule itself is acting as a spin filter uh, due to these changes into the uh, electronic structure of the molecule when it's in contact with the metal. Um, Later on, more recently, people are starting to work into how to inject the spins, but without applying current. So most typically using pure spin current. So you have ferromagnetic resonance, you excite precession in a ferromagnet and due to the conservation of angular momentum, you generate a, a, a spin current into your uh, non-magnetic material. In this case, 
um, PBTT in a device uh, that the group from Searing House in Cambridge and uh, Saito in, in Tohoku measure together. Um, and then what you can see is that as, as you generate this resonance, ferromagnetic resonance, and you inject this spin current, if you put together a heavy metal with a large spin orbit coupling with your polymer material, the polymer has a very small spin orbit coupling, but in this case, a very large mobility. Um, then you put a, a heavy metal on the other end. The heavy metal is going to split the, uh, the currents in different directions. And because of the different chemical potentials for spin up or spin down, that is going to translate into a voltage that you can measure uh, the inverse spin hole effect. But in this case, measured through a molecular layer. And what we could see is that uh, this uh, PBTT polymer uh, could still uh, transport the pure spin current that will be detected then by the platinum. Uh, the signal obviously decays depending on the thickness of the PBTT layer, but you still can observe that inverse spin hole effect for up to 250 nanometers of, of polymer, which is quite remarkable. And then they did the same thing for P.PSS, which is a very typical polymer for uh, organic solar cells. And again, they have the same, the same effects. Uh, they could correlate it this time with the magnetic field and the frequency used to generate the FMR and the spin current. They think that they have uh, an spin current and an inverse spin hole effect that is inversely proportional to the field and the frequency. It could be argued perhaps that this could also be fit with a, with a flat uh, linear dependence, um, a constant essentially, but nevertheless, that's, that's what their calculations show. Um, again, um, the group of Bardeni in Utah um, then decided that there was a better way of doing this, that it was uh, rather than using conventional FMR, they were going to use pulse FMR where they can send a much larger uh, microwave uh, uh, current down a waveguide to generate a larger spin current and therefore a larger inverse spin hole effect. And they did this with many different molecules. Um, um, I don't remember the names to be honest with you, um, but of course they use as well C60 and PBTTT and PSS. And what they saw is that very surprisingly, when they use only platinum, they measure um, uh, an um, a spin hole effect voltage or inverse spin hole effect voltage of about 1.6 millivolts. Other molecules, even those that contain platinum in their molecular structure or polymer structure, give much smaller results, but it's still measurable. However, C60, uh, just plain carbon, car carbon though, gave the largest inverse spin hole effect voltage, 200 microvolts, comparable to pure platinum. And the spin hole angle uh, derived from, so the ratio between the spin current and uh, normal charge current derived from the anomalous hole effect and the inverse hole effect measurements was also only a factor two or three difference between C60 and platinum. Um, measurements with C60 in spintronics also include uh, from the uh, group in the uh, University of South Florida, Shrinker, uh, where they did the spin civic effect measurements. So the spin civic effects is where you generate the uh, spin current by a change in temperature, that the spin current then generates the voltage. So it's similar to the civic effect in that you have a voltage induced by a thermal gradient, but the difference is here you have the spin contribution from the different, different chemical potentials of spin up and spin down. And what they observe is that if you do the measurement uh, in a conventional structure that is jig, that is a ferromagnetic insulator and platinum, uh, you get uh, a spin civic voltage of the order of 0 0.6, 0 0.8 uh, microvolts, but if you separate the two layers by five nanometers of C60, you can increase this effect by up to almost an order of magnitude at low temperatures, not so low, 140 Kelvin or so. So again, it seems like the molecule C60 is enhancing the effect that we see in the conventional structure and the metallic, in this case, magnetic offset. Of course, there is people who also studies new functionalities. I mentioned before spin photovoltaics in the group of Wesso, where what you have is that the C60 acts as a solar cell, very low efficiency, of course, because it's not a proper solar cell, but still a photovoltaic effect. 
uh, where then the response that you have depends on the relative alignment of the two magnetic electrodes used there. And obviously, because you have a current that is dependent on the uh, photo excitation, you can have huge magnetoconductance traces because you can go from having no photocurrent to a small photocurrent. So the ratio is actually enormous. And there is also, for example, the Einstein the Haas experiments that once offered it in the molecules for the conservation of the spin and angular momentum, where the molecule can rotate depending on the uh, on the actual spin ordering of, of, of induced by the magnetic field. And therefore you can have changes in the quantum tunneling of the spins depending on the on the molecule orientation and the magnetic field. And we also have uh, experiments like here from Thanetol where they can manipulate the magnetic resistance of the molecular layer by using a piezoelectric substrate. So you combine uh, magnetic and ferroelectric or piezoelectric functionalities uh, in a multifunctional, not quite multiferroic, but hybrid multifunctional structure. If you want to go into more topological and exotic quantum structures, then we have, for example, the work of uh, Mark Mirko Sinchetti, where he could shift the conduction and valence bands of topological insulators, in this case, bismuth telluride, by using uh, talocyanins. Or we can also have the work of Wensdorf, uh, sorry, uh, Wiesendanger and, and, and colleagues, where they studied the topological um, spin textures, skirmions in this case, uh, when they put different carbon allotropes, it's not quite cystic, but they are uh, part of uh, carbon cages and, and graphene, uh, graphene and, and other carbon allotropes and study the magnetic coupling. Or we have in more exotic the, the work of Francis Pratt in, in ISIS and collaborators, Sandrine Hills as well was involved here, Nicola Morley, where you can have um, a spin liquid in a molecular layer uh, and depending on the critical quantum transition, you can have a magnetic or non-magnetic uh, spin liquid ordering at, at very low temperatures. So this is my overview of the many things that you can do with molecules. It's not just limited to magnetic tunnel junctions. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit what, what we do in our group. Um, we mostly use C60. Uh, there are many reasons for that. Um, it's a very interesting molecule with many interesting properties. It's not very exciting for, for, for chemists. Uh, editors sometimes have their reservations because it has been known for many years. But it's a very interesting molecule for spintronics. It gives rise to, to many unexpected results. And I think it's partly because of that curvature of the molecule and that different rehabilitation depending on how the molecule orients itself on metals. Uh, it's also a molecule that is, is compatible with sputtering. Uh, you can sputter metals on top and have very nice multilayers. It's compatible with molecular beam epitaxy. You don't have to worry about cross-contamination. It has a very uh, a very low uh, vapor pressure, so you can, uh, you can heat your system. You can make nice vacuum, and, and the molecules are not going to contaminate. And it has a lot of interesting intrinsic properties in terms of luminescence. Um, vibration hopping transport it can be doped. You can do endohedral stuff with lithium. So for us, this is is a is an ideal molecule, and also it has the very big advantage that because there are no metals involved, you you are more safe in terms of impurities um, that could be magnetic. Uh, usually, you can get very uh, perfect powders with with extremely low uh, metal content on them. So our first studies were with cobalt and C60. And the first thing that we noticed is that if you compare at 100 Kelvin or less, the hysteresis loop of cobalt with respect to the hysteresis loop of cobalt with um, C60. Um, in here, we measure cobalt, and then we put a, a spacer of copper, and then the C60, you can see the coercivity of your film is very small, as you will expect from a typical transition metal thick enough, five nanometers measuring plane. But as soon as you put C60, you enhance that coercivity and you reduce the magnetization of your sample. Not only that, but the better the vacuum you do this at, the bigger the effect. So if you do this at a better vacuum, then the coercivity is even bigger and the magnetization is even further reduced. So the, the coupling between the molecule and the and the metal, as you will expect, is very affected by, by any oxygen that can be, or water in particular, that can be in your chamber. So you need to be in the 10 to the minus 10 
partial pressure militor, uh, sorry, minibar partial pressure of water if you want to see this effect. The other surprising thing we saw is that these effects propagate to very thick molecular layers. So as you make your thesis thicker and thicker, you see bigger and bigger effects, and this extends up to several hundred nanometers. But these effects only kick in uh, at about 200 Kelvin, and you don't really see them so much with iron and nickel. You still see them, but they are much stronger in cobalt. We did PNR, like uh, the group of uh, Sumnakar, uh, and, and what we saw is that this uh, change in the magnetization and the coercivity is because of an antiferromagnetic coupling and the interface between the molecule and the metal that later becomes uh, ferromagnetic. Uh, and that this gives rise to this uh, asymmetric hysteresis loop that also the group of Michael Bowen had, Martin Bowen had, had reported. This initial uh, change in the magnetization is what we attribute to the induced magnetization in the molecules. And then what we have is the reversal of the, of the cobalt film. And you can see that using C60, you can have coercivities of the order of up to almost 1.5, or if you annul the sample, 1.6 tes Teslas at low temperatures, which is humongous for an in-plane measurement in, in, in cobalt. Um, but as I was saying, this all peaks at about 200 Kelvin, which makes us wonder why is that the case? Why does all this kick in the bias? Uh, the, well, it's not really biased, as we'll see, it's just a change in the reversal mechanism um, and, the, and the increased coercivity of our sample. So what we analyze with uh, our collaborators in micromagnetics and DFT simulations is the charge transfer and hybridization at the interface between the metal and the molecule. And what we saw is that what is happening is we are forming a, a, a spin polarized electrical dipole uh, that then pins the molecule physically in a certain configuration. And then you need a very large magnetic field to force the molecule to rotate. Once the molecule rotates in that magnetic field, then you destroy the pinning. So what you are seeing here is not a change bias. What you are seeing here is a reversal where the magnetic field first rotates the molecule. And that's why you need a very large magnetic field to do it. And once the molecule is rotated and the electrical dipole is, is, is destroyed, then the coercivity is, is much smaller. And then it remains smaller for all the consecutive loops that you measure. And that can be seen also in AMR measurements where you can see that this first reversal doesn't have uh, a, a peak because we are not forming domains. It's a, it's, a, a, it's a coherent change in the magnetization due to the rotational of the molecules. And then once that is destroyed, then we can see the AMR peak emerging again. We decided to use this idea then to with normal metals and see what will happen if we put C60 with uh, copper and manganese because they are either side of the uh, three only elements that are ferromagnetic at room temperature, iron, cobalt, and nickel, as long as it's not too cold and gadolinium remains paramagnetic. Um, and the idea was to try to change the electronic structure of copper and manganese so that we could overcome the stoner criterion and see if we could make these metals magnetic. We saw that indeed, if we had copper and we uh, put it directly in contact with C60, we can have a hysteresis loop and induce magnetization. If we break the interface between copper and C60 with aluminium, then that emergent magnetization disappears and we go back to a diamagnetic or paramagnetic, depending whether we use copper or manganese, uh, hysteri well, not hysteresis, but magnetization loop. This is very dependent on the thickness of the metal layer that we use. If it's too thin, it's discontinuous and this effect disappears. If it's too thick, then there are screening effects in the metal and then uh, you don't see the effect either. So for copper, it's very narrowly constricted, we found to about one to about four nanometers roughly. Manganese uh, is closer to the stone and criterion, is paramagnetic. The effect we saw will extend farther but it will be a smaller. So the induced magnetization in manganese was a smaller, even though we could see it for thicker film. We wanted to make sure that this was not due to impurities, as you can imagine. So what we did is grow the same samples, but changing the number of interfaces. So the same amount of copper, the same amount of CCC, but broken down in different number of, of repeats. And we saw again that the magnetization only appears when the uh, copper layers that we are splitting our total copper thickness into 
uh, is between 1.5 and 3 nanometers. So we always have 9 nanometers of copper, but when we split it into 8 repeats, so 1.1 nanometers, these continuous copper layers, there is no magnetization. If we split it into two repeats of so 4.5 nanometers of copper, then again, no magnetization. Uh, and the same thing if you just put nine nanometers of copper on top of the system. Um, the other thing that is very characteristic of molecular structures in general, and these ones in particular, is that they degrade very quickly. One has to be very careful with how one measures. Uh, obviously, the oxidation depends on how thick your sample or your total sample is. The more interfaces you have, the longer it takes to lose your magnetization. But typically in about a couple of weeks, not most of your magnetization is gone. You can recover it by annealing it to about 500 Kelvin, which is the temperature at which oxygen dissociates from C60. So you can remove the oxygen from, from the interface and then you can recover at least partly this magnetization that you have in here. We did some extensive measurements to make sure where this magnetization was coming from. In this case, we did measurements of a scanning with C60. And as you can see in the carbon edge of, uh, of C60, you can clearly see dichroism indicating that uh, the carbon is indeed becoming uh, magnetized, mostly within a, an orbital moment rather than a spin moment, and localized to the pi star antibonding orbitals of the molecule rather than the sigma uh, uh, star uh, orbitals of, of, the, of the molecule. Uh, and obviously this is an effect that is very sample to sample dependent and very dependent on temperature. So at low temperatures, you have um, more well-defined molecular orbitals that give rise to a slightly different dichroism of the structure to what you see at room temperature. Um, collaborators doing DFT simulations try to explain this. And what they told us is that no matter how you set up the system, you always have a large electron transfer, in particular from copper to C60, of the order of one to three electrons uh, per cage, and a orbital rebridization of the interface. So the C60 at the interface becomes metallic and forms this electrical dipole with the metal that changes the electronic structure, and that results into a change of the, uh, uh, of the uh, excuse me, <coughs> exchange energy. So you harden magnetically your metal. Um, you harden it by about a factor two to three. This wouldn't be enough by itself to, to apply the stoner criterion. You still don't need the stoner criterion, but what you do is you, you change the shape of the, of, the, uh, of the electronic structure at the Fermi level as well. So what you can have is, is an induced magnetization when you grow these samples in the magnetic field. That is, that is what we do. Right, so very quickly, I'm going to explain a little bit about low energy muon spin spectroscopy because it's perhaps the technique that not many people use. It's, it's only done really in, in PSI, Pulsar Institute in Switzerland. Um, JPARC uh, in Japan also does it sometimes, but it's not so stable, not so high currents, and only sometimes. So, here what we have is conventional muon spin spectroscopy, which is more extended. But what they do is they moderate the energy of the muons using an argon solid cryogenic uh, filter. So they slow down these muons uh, uh, from energies of mega electron volts to almost zero. And then they re-accelerate these muons uh, to energies of the order of kilo electron volts. So by doing that, what they can do is they can control where in your samples the muons are going to stop. So think of the muon as if it was uh, a particle that you are going to use to probe your magnetic structure. And depending on the accelerating voltage that you impart to this uh, particle, uh, which has a mass equivalent to a proton roughly, uh, you are going to implant it at different depths in your, in your structure. Now the muons are fully spin polarized. And once they are implanted in your structure, they are going to process, their spin is going to process in the local magnetic field. And after 2.2 microseconds, the muon is going to decay and is going to emit a positron in the direction of the spin. So that means if your muon is oscillating, your positrons are also going to be emitted in an oscillating fashion. So if you surround then your samples by detectors, positron detectors, you will be able to see 
how your muons are oscillating in the local magnetic field generated at different depths in your sample. So it's a means of probing the magnetic information at different depths. In particular, in C60, the muons trap one of the electrons from C60 and form what is known as a muonium, which is the equivalent of a hydrogen atom, but with a muon instead of a proton and then an electron. And then that is going to uh, couple with the polarons, the vibrations of the molecule to form what is known as a muonium polaron. And this muonium polaron has the peculiarity that is very highly sensitive to the magnetic and electronic structure of your sample. So any changes in the local magnetization or the local uh, charge density is going to change the frequency of oscillation of your muonium. So we can use this to detect very small magnetic fields, which we did in the copper C60 samples. So in here we have two samples, one with the copper C60 interface, one without, and then we do our uh, muonium spectroscopy measurements. And then you can see that uh, comparing the uh, muonium effects uh, in samples that have this um, C60 interface, C60 copper interface and samples that do not have it, we have different precessions that indicate different local magnetic fields due to this emergent magnetization of the copper C60 interface. So you have an increased oscillating frequency in the copper C60 interface due to the emergent magnetization. Now, this emergent magnetization is very weak. Uh, so what can we use it for? How can we detect it? Our idea was to then use this in combination with superconducting samples. So what we have is a superconductor with C60 and then a superconductor with this emerging magnetic copper C60 interface that we call a spin converter. So the uh, copper pairs uh, from the niobium are going to diffuse into the C60. We can measure this diffusion by measuring the uh, superconducting critical temperature suppression when we put C60 and gold on top of the superconductor. And what we observe is that the copper pairs diffuse with a typical uh, length scale of the order of 30 nanometers. So your Cooper pairs will diffuse into the C60 for about, in average, 30 nanometers. Now, if we have uh, a uh, Cooper C60 interface, what we expect to see is that the induced magnetization at this interface will affect the diffusion of the Cooper pairs. And indeed, that is what happens. Uh, so what we see is that if we compare uh, by doing again low energy muon spin spectroscopy, the two structures. If we have plain niobium, so superconductor with C60, we can measure the Meissner effect, the diamagnetic reduction of the local magnetic field. So, what you see at the bottom in this graph here is the change in the local magnetic field, which is being reduced from 1 to 0 0.997 due to the Meissner effect. Sorry, the computer is going very slowly. <clears throat> but if you introduce the copper C60 interface, that diamagnetic effect is partly suppressed. So that uh, change in the local magnetic field is still negative, but not quite as negative as it was uh, before without the copper. If we use a multiprobe layer, then we can see that uh, we can even detect both the suppression of the diamagnetic effect and we can also detect the paramagnetic Meissner effect in the gold layer above the copper C60 interface. So that means our copper pairs are diffusing into the C60, so we can detect the diamagnetic signal in the C60, and then they are converting into paramagnetic copper pairs that then propagate all the way to a gold layer that is some uh, 50 nanometers, well, between 25 and 50 nanometers above the naive. So the copper C60 interface is converting the uh, uh, singlet Cooper pairs into triplet Cooper pairs. Very quickly, because we are running out of time, uh, a few more effects that we can see by using C60 is if we measure the spin hole MR. So in here, what we have is a heavy metal platinum or tantalum on top of, of a ferrimagnetic insulator gig. And what we do is we, we measure how the uh, spin current generated on, on the platinum uh, changes depending whether we have C60 on top or not. 
The first thing that we observe is that when we put C60 on top of platinum, we change the resistivity because we form this metallic interface. But surprisingly, if you put the C60 on top of tantalum, the resistivity is increased. If you put it on top of platinum, the resistivity is decreased. And that's also to do with the different slopes in the thermal dependence of the resistivity for, for both elements. And what we can see very clearly in here is that uh, by adding the C60, so in orange, you can enhance the spin hole magnet of resistance by up to a factor four or five with respect to the spin hole magnet of resistance that you see in platinum. The same thing is true for tantalum. You also enhance the spin hole magnet of resistance. The difference is many people do spin hole magnet of resistive measurements at large magnetic fields. That is very dangerous because you are starting to merge the spin hole magnet of resistance with other effects like ordinary magnet of resistance, Hanley effect, localization, um, thin field magnet of resistance. And those effects are also affected by the molecular layer, but differently in tantalum and platinum. In tantalum, those effects are large magnetic fields are enhanced by the C60. Uh, in platinum, those effects are resisted, but in both cases, the spin hole magnet of resistance is enhanced. Uh, how much is it enhanced? Well, by about a factor, up to a factor five or six, as I was saying before, but typically between 50 and 100 percent, 1.5 to a factor two. This can be interpreted as an enhancement in the spin hole angle, so perhaps a means to reduce the spin current in the spin transfer torque devices in the future, perhaps. This effect can also be seen in, in uh, AMR measurements of the platinum. So as you can see, adding C60 to the platinum gig structure doesn't change the shape of the AMR, but it does increase the effect of the AMR by a factor two to three or four. And it also makes this AMR more stable at higher temperatures. So in platinum C60, you can easily see that the AMR at room temperature, uh, and it has a very similar magnitude to low temperatures. Whereas without the C60, that AMR really is starting to die off uh, at low temperatures, at high temperatures. Optical functionalities, we don't really have much time, so I will just uh, pass over this. Just to mention that if you pass a spin current um, through a, a molecular layer, then you can both change the vibration and the spectrum. So, uh, and there's... yeah, I request you to discuss this spin pumping part. Okay, so let me just finish because there is not much time. If any of you is interested, I am of course happy to, to talk. Uh, and the last thing I really want to point out is, is the effect of spin storage, where if you apply a current to a, a, a C60 metal oxide interface, what you can do is you can trap a charge at the metal oxide molecular interface, or so like a capacitor, and that charge is a spin polarized. You can see that it's a spin polarized by doing XMCD measurements. And that charge remains a store and a spin polarized at that interface for macro scale time scale. So you can see those effects for minutes or even hours. Uh, and again, if anybody's interested, we can have a look more in detail. So just to conclude, you can use molecules to manipulate the, the magnetic properties of, of interfaces. Uh, you can use it to change the superconducting properties as well at, at long range uh, interactions and you can use it to fabricate devices. So thank you all. And thank you to, to all my many collaborators with whom, without whom, of course, all this would be impossible. Okay. Um, okay, uh, I'd like to thank you for this excellent uh, lecture. Uh, my student, Kubasa, uh, also sitting next to me because he's working in this field. Uh, we have really thoroughly enjoyed. So, before we take a few questions, uh, can I request you have two or three slides uh, towards the end, just before conclusion on the spin pumping? Do you mind to just give us a short overview of that? Sure. So, in the spin pumping, what we have is a conventional um, waveguide. Um, sorry, the computer is slow, so many slides. Yep. So we have a conventional waveguide ferromagnetic molecular structure. So you spin pump by generating ferromagnetic resonance, and then you can prove what happens to the molecular layer when you are at the resonant stage. 
So the first thing that you can see is that the damping uh, is enhanced by the presence of the molecules. So we know that there is a, a, a coupling between the ferromagnet and the molecules. So there is a, a spin current propagating into the molecule. You can also see that that damping changes depending whether your molecules are optically irradiated or not. So by optical irradiation, you can change the interface between the ferromagnet and the molecules, and you can change the, the damping that you observe. Uh, and interestingly, you can then do simultaneous Raman spectroscopy uh, measurements together with the fMR uh, measurements. And what you see is that during the resonance, when you are spin pumping, the Raman peaks of your molecules are shifted. So you have a different vibrational spectra when you have the spin current in your molecules. And also you can see that the uh, luminescence of your, uh, well, the optical reflectance uh, or absorbance also changes. Uh, so you, you uh, enhance the optical absorbance when you are in, in resonance and the luminescence of your molecules also changes. So here you have a comparison of uh, in resonance and out of resonance. So you can see you have about 200% enhanced uh, uh, optical luminescence in the C60 during luminescence. And that enhancement disappears when you separate the C60 and the ferromagnet with an alumina layer, or when you measure the C60 on the outside the ferromagnet. So that's a luminescence enhancement due to the spin pumping. And the reason you have that enhancement of the luminescence is that the spin current is destroying the uh, dipole at the interface and reducing the non-radiative energy transfer from the metal to the mole from the molecule dipole to the metal. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, it was a really nice lecture. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed. I have still many questions I will ask. But before that, uh, we take the questions from others. Uh, so, uh, okay, one person has a general question. Can I have the recorded version of the webinar? Yes, uh, we will post it in YouTube, uh, maybe in a day or two, and you can uh, go through it again. Uh, there is a question from Sonia. What do you mean by weak hyperfine interactions in low J elements? No, no, no. I, 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 if I say so, I misspoke. The, the hyperfine interaction or is very small in carbon. There is no nuclear uh, moment, at least in carbon-12. In carbon-13, there is, but it's only 1.5% 1 1 of the isotopes are carbon-13. In addition to that, carbon is very light, and therefore, the spin-orbit coupling is very small. So two separate things. If I mix them, I apologize. Yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> thanks for clarifying. Probably we meant about low spin-orbit coupling and particularly molecules like C60, which is free of hydrogen. So their hyperfine interaction will be less. Yeah, uh, okay, I have a couple of questions. Uh, so this, uh, to start with uh, this uh, copper C60, or let's say we, we are talking about the, the, the spin pumping. So uh, what is actually the uh, underneath mechanism which enhances the spin orbit coupling in let's say carbon? because here it's a very low jet element and we are seeing remarkable spin pump. Yeah. So yeah. what is the origin of this uh, enhanced uh, SOC? So this was already reported by, by Bardini and Bowen in, in Utah that they have very large inverse spin hole effect in, in C60. Uh, and the only reason I can think of for that is, is the curvature of the molecule. So uh, in carb molecules, you are going to have a larger spin orbit coupling because you have your orbital spin deformed. Uh, in graphene, you will expect to have known contribution, obviously, because it's perfectly flat. But in C60, which is one of the smallest of the field-leading molecules, this can be very large. And this was also some observed long time ago in people who were doing measurements in carbon nanotubes. So when you have a single wall carbon nanotube with a very small diameter and very high curvature, uh, then you can see a very large spin orbit coupling on those on, on those uh, molecules. Um, so in my opinion, that's where the, the intrinsic large spin orbit coupling of thin system might be coming from. Yeah, I mean, uh, Oscar, I agree. Uh, there is this scientific report, I forgot the name of the author, where they discussed about the curvature induced uh, enhancement of SOC. But mm -hmm. um, I don't know there are other papers or not. I can discuss in person with you, but uh, 
uh, this one actually, how exactly the curvature is enhancing the SOC? Do you have some idea on that? So you are asking how the curvature enhances the spin orbit coupling? Yes. Oh, because you are deforming the orbitals. Okay. So uh, rather than having them in flat in plane, now you have your pi uh, uh, bonds, anti-bonds. They have to be pushed out of plane. So you increase the, the coupling between uh, the spin and the orbital that now is not in plane. It's not uh, all uh, flat in the same position. So in theory, the more you push your orbit, you force your orbitals to be out of their, I wouldn't say natural position, but their all collinear position, the higher your spin orbit coupling becomes. And you can do simulations to, to, to predict this. Uh, however, my understanding is that it's, it's still surprising because this effect shouldn't result in anything near platinum. I mean, yes, it's a contribution, but it's still a light element. The spin orbit coupling should still be very small. So I don't think it's still fully understood. Um, it's to do with it, but not sure how. Yeah, I mean, uh, the point is uh, we have also seen high uh, spin bombing, so we are in spin all effect. We are just going to, we are writing a manuscript on that. But I want to really, uh, so when you say that the curvature is enhancing the SOC, so that means uh, when you have a C60 molecule or, or a, this uh, like buckyball structure, so the SOC is already enhanced. It doesn't matter that you deposit on a film or not, isn't it? Well, there are two different things there. One is the intrinsic spin orbit coupling of C60, and then is how C60 enhances the spin orbit coupling of a metal. And that is uh, also controversial because one could say there is some RASPA effect where you have an interfacial dipole and your molecules are changing the RASPA effect. And that is affecting the effective spin orbit coupling, not the actual atomic spin orbit coupling, but when you do measurements that depend on the spin orbit coupling, like spin scattering or uh, spin hole magneto resistance or uh, spin transfer torque, um, those measurements will depend on this interfacial effect. However, what the simulations that collaborators have done with us point out is that it is not the RASPA um, dipole that, that is responsible for this, but a change in the electronic structure of the metal. So the metal is given electrons to the, to the, to the molecule. Uh, and in addition to that, the B orbitals of the metal are hybridizing with the pi orbitals of the molecule. That is changing the, the electronic structure of the metal. And that is changing the spin orbit coupling splitting of the bands in the electronic structure. That is different from the conventional understanding of a spin orbit coupling as an atomic effect, the, the nucleus and, and the orbitals and the spin but it still affects any measurement that depends on the spin of the coupling. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, well, I understand this uh, explanations in terms of intrinsic and uh, some kind of extrinsic, but if you look, the extrinsic is also one kind of intrinsic. It is again going back to the orbital and uh, yeah, so it's also, okay, you enhance in the total system, but. Um, it's very interesting. Actually, it is still probably not very clearly understood. Uh, so Indeed, indeed. I mean, it's still work to be done. Um, but for us, the fact that both the SHMR and the AMR, importantly, in both platinum and tantalum, increase when you put C60 on them, yeah. independently of whether the resistivity is increased or reduced. So for both systems, these enhance. That means there is an enhancement of the spin orbit coupling. We cannot say the spin orbit coupling is different, or, but the effect of the spin orbit coupling is enhanced. So the, how the spins are split according in direction according to their uh, orientation depends on this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have one more question before I go to anybody else. Um, in the copper C60 business, so where you uh, very nicely so and recently also we published a paper where we put or quantify the induced mo movement in copper. Uh, but I still wonder, because uh, the uh, there are two questions basically. First of all, why it happens for a very particular uh, thickness range of copper, which is about two nanometer. Uh, 
very narrow uh, thickness range. And the second question is, uh, which you have also done very nicely the DFT calculations and you showed that the stoner criteria is still not fulfilled. So what exactly happens? I mean, that which creates this ferromagnetism? Could you like to tell you? Yeah. Okay, so as to the, the thickness, uh, I think it's simply you need, you need the layer to be as thin as possible. But because you are growing it on C60 and C60 is very rough, well, relatively. Um, as soon as you try to grow anything that is less than one nanometer thick, you start to grow in islands. And then you don't have the same electronic structure. You destroy the whole effect. Now, if you make it one to two nanometers, then you have very good effect. But if you start to make it thicker and thicker, then the screening length, the Fermi length, if you want, of your metal, uh, it starts to be uh, shorter than the thickness of your film. And then what you could say is happening is that you are mostly measuring bulk copper rather than copper C60 interface. However, I think that is not only the case. It's also the case that unless your hybridized electronic structure propagates for the whole of the copper film, this effect disappears. And what we discuss with the colleagues who do the theory is about the emergence of this of this effect is that indeed you are not beating in that way the stoner criterion you are overpassing it in that what is happening is that at the fermi energy the curvature of the uh, density of the electronic structure of copper changes from positive to negative when you have the c system you are changing the curvature of your electronic structure at the fermi level when you do that, if you do it in the presence of, of a magnetic field, then you can induce an exchange split if you have hardened your metal. And that, uh, and that exchange split of your, of your electronic structure, which is not ferromagnetism, but it's a magnetic order, then it remains metastable there. So it will remain there, I don't know for how long, days, months, years, whatever. And that is, that is what is generating the hysteresis loop. Uh, but the effect, as you know, is, is a small. It's not equivalent to the magnetization you see in iron or cobalt or, or whatever. So that's why you, I don't think you can have a proper magnet made like this, but you can have a spintronic effects like I have shown for, for, for uh, Cooper pairs, where you can, because it's a weak ferromagnet, localized ferromagnet, you can change the spin structures, but not make ferromagnets out of it. You are muted, sorry. Okay, uh, I mean, thank you. So it's basically kind of exchange splitting due to this curvature of the density of states at the Fermi level. And uh, uh, yes, uh, this, has, this has a name and there was a Russian scientist that, that predicted this. The name escapes me, but it's in the in the nature paper. In I think in the supplementary information, uh, uh, there is the, the original paper that, okay. that discussed the change in the curvature. Yeah, it's very fascinating actually, and a lot of other metals. I think I mean you have done in your PNS uh, paper some other metals, mm -hmm. and uh, so neat. Uh, but I think this field is very interesting, and uh, we can still do probably a little bit to understand more. Yeah. Yeah. If we understood it perfectly, it wouldn't be so interesting. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you so much. So, are there any other questions from uh, some other participants? Please. Uh, I have one question. Yeah, please, Raj, go ahead. Uh, Oscar, yeah, very nice talk, and you have summarized most of the people have done the work. I have a question regarding the tunnel spin valve structure, actually. Actually, so what's the main mechanism in organic spin valve structures, actually? Because there are three mechanisms you use insulator. Elastic tunneling is there and resonant tunneling and elastic tunneling. But if you consider here, people are using a thicker ones. So however, the spin diffusion length is also varying from few nanometer, five nanometer to 100 nanometer. So what is the basic mechanism in such kind of spin valve structure? Okay, um, if you will have noticed, we, we don't work on this and that is because, uh, yeah, I'm a bit so so on, on, on this field. The first thing is that this never works unless you put uh, uh, an insulator layer in between one of the electrodes and the molecule. If the molecules are in direct contact with both electrodes, forget it, you are not going to see magnet. Well, 
you may see some magnetoresistance, resistance, but it's going to be much smaller if you see it. Um, and the way it happens is, or the way it's understood this happens is, the electrons first tunnel through that barrier, or insulating barrier, just one nanometer thick or so. So for example, Wessel's group makes it just 0 0.9 nanometers thick. So it's almost discontinuous. It's just to decouple the molecule from the metal. Other people makes it more like 1.5 to nanometers. So electrons tunnel through that barrier. And then they, by thermal activation, they hop between molecules. So it's, uh, uh, if you are not very, I don't know if you're familiar with variable range hopping, but it's a very small tunneling of just an Armstrong or a few Armstrongs each of these. In each of these hopping steps, there is a chance that the spin will flip because of, uh, of thermal uh, uh, fluctuations. So the more hops, the more chances that your electron is going to depolarize before it rise to the other electron. However, because the spin orbit coupling is very small and the hyperfine uh, 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 interaction is also small, at least in CCC, you can have many hops before statistically your spin is going to flip. So that's why you can have in the case of CCST, a hundred nanometers of CCST. So I don't know how many hops that will be, let's say of the order of a hundred or 200 hops before actually you lose all your spin polarization. And then they drop into the second electrode through the sub key barrier that is going to be between the molecule and the second electrode uh, uh, semiconducting metal interface. Does, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, actually I worked on magnetic tunnel junction based on MGO. So where mm -hmm. we consider there are a lot of defects then create a lot of uh, localized states and then there is hoping. So hoping is a negative in that uh, tunnel junctions. But here you're saying that you're telling me that uh, if there is a hoping then because it is a spin flipping, so there is certain thickness where uh, more spin flipping within uh, one type of the spin, so it is considering like that, isn't that? So when each hoping it is losing its spin, right? It is flipping the spin, right? There is a percentage of chance that you will lose a spin in one hop. So let's say it's a 1%. So yeah. if there is only one, one hop, then 99% of your polarization will remain. If there are a hundred hops, then you will end up with a depolarized current. Uh, okay, 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 thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, are there other questions by anyone? If not the case, then I think uh, we can now summarize. It's a very nice uh, overview of a really uh, uh, the, uh, long, you know, um, long standing uh, problems and open issues. You have really done a fantastic job, Oscar, putting your efforts making this overview. I'm really grateful. I'm sure others have enjoyed it uh, thoroughly. So then I think we can summarize uh, uh, for today's lecture. So again, let's clap for uh, Oscar Cespedes for this excellent lecture. Um, good. Thank you, so so much for, thank you so much for the invitation and I'm very happy. Yeah, it's really our pleasure and we are very grateful that you accepted it and we could listen and learn many things. And we all wish you a very good health. Please stay safe. And uh, yeah, have a nice long weekend ahead. So see you, take care, bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you all. Thank you, bye.